Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Barbell Mamas podcast. Christina Previtt here, and today we're going to be talking about all things preparing barbell athletes for labor and delivery. <laughs> Before we do, if I sound a little bit excited, I must tell you, I am recording this video in the afternoon, and you know those days that just spark so much creativity and so much excitement. I am having one of those days. I have gotten on a couple of calls. For those who kind of don't know my backstory, I am a pelvic floor physical therapist and I am a barbell athlete. But one of the things that I love and I am very heavily involved in is research and specifically research around resistance training across the lifespan. And one of those being pregnant athletes. And I just recently finished my PhD. And so I'm going to be starting some of my next journey around looking at resistance training during pregnancy and working with specific groups of individuals. And I am getting into these conversations about what these next steps are. And it lights my soul on fire because it is just so needed. And so we're starting to get the ball rolling on some things that I'm sure I'm going to be sharing with you all because I'm going to need your help um, from a recruitment perspective. And I'm just so pumped. And so if I sound really excited in my voice, um, that is why. But we also want to record this podcast because it is a, a topic very near and dear to me and one that I think can provide a lot of value. So let's kind of get started. The way that I want to really preface this episode is that it is so common for our athletes who are exercising during pregnancy. So whatever exercise you choose to do, running, CrossFit, powerlifting, weightlifting, Pilates, yoga, that people say, oh, you're so fit. You are just going to pop this baby out. It's going to be no problem. You're going to go through labor and delivery so smoothly. And yes, that might be true. But also, it might not be. And everybody's labor and delivery story is going to be different. And so while I am going to talk about some of the research around exercise and labor and delivery outcomes, know that everybody's story is going to be different. And if you are that person who tends to say that to mamas, know that when it doesn't go well, and everybody was telling them that it was going to be easy, and then they believed that it wasn't easy or they had a very traumatic experience, it can almost like feed into this spiral of feeling like a failure or feeling like they somehow did something wrong and birth and labor and delivery, as much as we can prepare for it. And we want you to be empowered and knowledgeable going into your labor and delivery story there is also a lot of things that are completely outside of our control with labor and delivery. And you can do all of the right things and still have what you believe to be or what is a negative outcome. So the first thing is that we're going to talk about kind of stacking the deck in our favor with respect to the way that we can prepare our bodies for labor and delivery, but also know that there are a lot of different ways that labor and delivery can go. And that same story that happens in two different people, one can take it as a really positive thing and others can take it very negatively. And it's because we are all in our own circumstances and none of those things are right and wrong. And it's just about finding a team to support your thoughts, feelings, and desires about labor and delivery and what happened during your labor and delivery. Okay, that's kind of the way I'm going to preface this. As a pelvic floor physical therapist, one of the things that is really fun to do is labor prep. There is a lot that we can do during pregnancy to help make labor and delivery feel a little bit easier. And by easier, I don't mean less painful. And by easier, I don't mean shorter. What I mean is the more that you are aware of what is going to happen and decisions that you can make and preferences that you want during your labor and delivery, the easier of a transition sometimes it can be when you're going through labor and delivery. What I tell a lot of pregnant people is that, yes, we want to prepare for labor and delivery, 
But we also want to prepare for the early postpartum period. I mean, feel like there's a lot of time and energy on for a very good reason for the big D day. But then we don't think about as much about what happens on the other side in that early recovery phase. So we're going to talk about labor and delivery. We're definitely going to do upcoming episodes about that early postpartum period. We've done a little bit around C-section recovery, but just ways for you to exercise before six weeks. We've done some of that and we can start talking about early postpartum care um, in a more broad sense in further episodes. But we have some stuff that we've done up until this point. Okay, so the first thing that we talk about when it comes to preparing for labor and delivery is what the heck is going to happen. <laughs> and so we know that anywhere between 38 and 42 weeks, um, you will go into labor or you can be scheduled for a cesarean or you can be scheduled for an induction. Those are all kind of ways for labor to get started. We're going to talk about what would happen if you did not have an induction or a planned cesarean. We're going to talk about going into labor the in a physiological way without medical intervention. I'm not going to say natural because everything is natural. Um, so physiological way. So at some point between 38 and 42 weeks, your body is going to start contracting. And there's a lot of thoughts about are Braxton Hicks a sign? Are lightning crash a sign? Are there certain things that are going to happen leading up to labor and delivery that will make you think, oh, it's about to happen soon? And from my experience and a lot of my colleagues who work with pregnant people all the time, there really isn't a telltale sign. Like even the Hollywood, your water breaks, that doesn't happen for some people. You know, I had one friend of mine who just recently, she's at the gym and her water, like, like she peed her pants, her, it gushed all over the gym floor. And then, you know, other people, they are in labor, in active labor, and they don't start pushing until they have had their water broken by their midwife or their obstetrician. Like, there's just, there's so much variability there. But at some point, your body is going to start contracting. And there's kind of two ways that contractions can be felt. And there's some thought that it might be the position of the baby that's going to bias towards feeling one versus the other. I, I haven't seen any research on that. You just kind of see it a bit clinically, but you can start to have contractions that are predominantly around your belly, which kind of feel like this vice grip, or they start as really significant menstrual cramps and then gradually build up in intensity. And then some people it'll bias more towards their back and it'll feel like these this back cramp or back labor. I have heard that back labor does feel more significant or harder to manage. Um, but again, a lot of this is anecdotal and we don't have a ton of research to say it's gonna be one way or the other. But not everybody experiences their contractions at the front of their belly. Most do, not all. Your, when you are starting to have contractions, you are considered to be in the first stage of labor. When we kind of tease apart um, the research on the first stage of labor, it, we kind of tease it apart to latent versus active. And this is where people can be sometimes um, mistaken or led astray as to how long labor takes because you see these studies that are on first stage versus second stage of labor. And I'm going to, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but know that this active and latent first stage of labor is by far the longest stage. So latent labor is from the first kind of feeling of cramping. And you're thinking, is this labor? Is this not? Did I eat something? Am I dehydrated? Is this a kind of Braxton Hicks? I don't know. To four centimeters dilated. So that's the latent stage. And this can be a really long stage. Like you can be in this stage for a day. And people will say, I've been, I was in labor for 48 hours. And people who've never had kids before are like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in that much unrelenting pain for 48 hours. And I try to ease people's mind and say, you know, it starts infrequent, less intense, and irregular, your contractions. And then the shorter period, but the more intense period is when we start getting from that latent stage to active stage. 
And there are some thoughts about how you progress, if it's a seven meter an hour or whatever. Everyone, again, is individual. You're going to have some people who are going to take forever to go from zero to three. And then from three to 10 is going to ramp really fast. You're going to see some people who get from zero to eight really quickly and then stall. There's a lot of ebbs and flows that happen in that first stage. Latent zero to four centimeters can be a long time. Four to 10 tends to pick up a little bit and the intensity of your contractions do as well. When you're in that active first stage of labor, intensity of contractions go up, the length of contractions go up, and the frequency or how long you have in between contractions goes down. And the idea of that part of your labor is to soften and dilate your cervix. For the last 10 months, there's been essentially a plug in your cervix. That's the mucus plug that people talk about you losing. And as we start to dilate, it takes your cervix and your cervix starts to move apart to make room for baby to come down the birth canal. Your mucus plug can be left. Again, we don't have evidence that if you lose your mucus, mucus plug, you're going to start labor within 24 hours. We don't really know. And you start to soften to let baby's head descend down from the uterus and come into that bowl of the cervix. And then the cervix starts to move apart to allow baby's head to come down into the birth canal or into the vaginal walls. And so from zero to 10 centimeters is when basically we're softening and moving the cervix out of the way enough that there's enough space for baby's head to move down into the birth canal. From there, once we get to 10 centimeters, then baby's head is gonna be in the right position. You're gonna be dilated enough that you can start the active pushing stage of labor, which is the second stage. This is much shorter, typically under two to three hours. And depending on your provider, they're gonna decide how long they are going to let you push or that you can be monitored and, and see what that takes. We'll talk about that in a second, but that is that active pushing stage. When we think about the pushing stage, it is important for us to know it is your uterus that is contracting. Your uterus is a smooth muscle and it contracts from the top and essentially gives pressure down to allow baby to continue moving and moving and moving. When we are pushing, it's not our abs that are doing the work. It's our uterus that is doing the work and we're giving like an extra little oomph and support from our surrounding muscles to help baby come out. The other thing is that during this active stage, if you don't have an epidural and you can feel it, an unmedicated delivery, you're going to feel these waves happen. So you do not need to constantly be pushing. And we would actually recommend that you don't and that you wait for the surges in your body to tell you that it is time to push so that you can keep progressing through that second stage. I remember, so I've had two unmedicated vaginal births. And I remember the first time, one of the things that I wasn't as prepared for is the fact that progress in that pushing stage is not always completely linear. What I mean by that is that as you push, baby will come down and then baby will come up a little bit and then baby will come down and then baby will come up a good bit. And you sometimes when you're seeing that baby retract or you're feeling it, you're just like, oh my gosh, it's gonna take forever for this baby to get here. And it's extremely strenuous. It is very tiring during this time and then Finally, baby's head pops out. Once you get baby's head out, you really are so close. That's where you're going to experience that ring of fire. If you're going unmedicated, that feels like an Indian rubber burn around the walls of your vaginal opening. And you continue to push. Once shoulders have been delivered, baby then gets moved and pushed out. And delivery of baby is complete. From there, that is the end of the second stage of labor. From there, there's the third stage of delivery, which a lot of people don't really think about, but is important too. And that's the delivery of the placenta. 
it is considered its own stage. It is the shortest stage. It is extremely important because we need to be clear and sure that all of the placenta gets taken out because when baby is not supporting and, and being connected to that blood supply, that tissue will start to die because it's not needed anymore. If it is retained, it can cause a lot of complications. So doc or provider, midwife, obstetrician, whomever is delivering your baby is going to make sure that the placenta is fully delivered and that there isn't any what's called retained tissue there that would potentially cause some issues down the road. That third stage of labor too, once the placenta is delivered, is if there was any tearing that causes or needs repair, they are going to do that during that time. So that's kind of like labor in a nutshell. What are things that we need to know or things that would be involved in a birth prep session that would be helpful for a pregnant person who's listening to this podcast to know? And specifically, we'll talk about our barbell athletes and what they need to know. So first thing, positioning. This is something that has gotten a lot of attention in the last little bit around how to labor. Most people will labor on their back in what's called lithotomy position, where legs are up on stirrups or legs are up. And you're kind of in this on your back, deep squat position. This is very typical, a very typical position. I know a lot of people who feel super comfortable, but there was some research that showed that when you don't have that um, tailbone, that sacrum fixed to a surface, that allowing it to move a little bit more can sometimes prevent some tearing. And that made a lot of people really think about different ways that you can push or you can be doing that active pushing stage of labor. There are tons of different options. You can go into a supported squat position. You can be in a sideline position. You can be on all fours. It is completely up to you. And what I would encourage you to do is play around with these positions. See what feels comfortable for you, number one, and think about how you would want to birth. The next thing is to talk to your provider. This was something that with my son, I was so thankful for the conversation that I had with my provider because it gave me insights that I feel get lost sometimes on social media. For my son, my second, I really didn't want to birth on my back. I was super active during my labors and I always feel better handling pain when I'm moving. During my labor and delivery, I was moving around a lot. I was walking a ton. And the same was true with my second. And when it came to my conversations with my obstetrician, I said, you know, I really don't want to labor on my back. I would love to try and be in a squat or four point or, or whatever it may be, whenever the time comes, I was induced with my first, I wasn't going to be induced with my second because I ended up being okay. And, and can kind of, let's have a conversation about this. What she told me, I will never forget. She said, I am totally good with that. We can try out whatever positions work for you. Just as we're delivering the shoulders, if you could move on your back, I would feel more comfortable in that position to make sure that I could catch baby and baby would be okay. If you are adamantly against being on your back and your provider said that, then you can say, you know, maybe I try a different provider. You don't have to say, you don't have to have a direct confrontation, but it's important to recognize what your provider is comfortable with as well. You know, I would never want to go into a internal pelvic floor exam without the training because, you know, somebody was saying, I really want you to do this internal exam. And I mean, this not to be like confrontational or to be, you know, um, speaking, you know, hot take, but more that it's really important for us to have conversations with our providers and for us to come to a mutual decision because their liability is there as well with how delivery occurs. 
And it's also up to you to say, you know, I am not okay with that. I want to do it this way. Maybe we need to try and find a different provider for me that feels more comfortable or has the training. Both of those things are okay and are involved in this decision-making process because you are picking that provider for a reason. You are trusting them with your care. And when they are saying that they aren't, don't feel comfortable with something, we want to trust that we are saying that they are saying that to us with your best interest in mind, or else we really don't have the best provider or the best relationship with that provider if we don't think that they're coming from that place. So the positioning piece is important. There are lots of different options. It is absolutely okay for you to labor on your back if that feels better for you. And then the second part of this positioning piece is, okay, well, what happens if I get an epidural? In general, what we see from the first stage of labor perspective is that the more that we move around, the better we are to handle pain. We can see that there's research that dancing in the middle of labor, having music on in the background can be so helpful for dealing with active contractions, leaning against a support person, if that's your spouse, if that's your partner, if that's your parent, whomever is in the room with you or whoever is helping you during your labor and delivery, leaning against them and having that rhythmic movement can help during that first stage. If you get to a point and you're like, give me an epidural, I want it right now. Um, that's totally fine too. Know that you are not going to be able to have as much freedom of movement because there's more monitoring that has to happen. Your legs will be numb. And so you still can move around and there are some ways to position your body. For example, with a peanut ball that can help you get into different positions during pushing when you have an epidural. That's totally possible. And again, a really important conversation for you to have with your provider. The next thing about labor and delivery, so positioning is number one. Number two is how to push. Where we can see this being a very, very important topic for the barbell athlete is that many people push with a Valsalva maneuver. So they are holding their breath and they are pushing down into their pelvic floor to help baby come out. With our barbell athletes, they have spent potentially years doing the exact opposite. When baby is coming down into the birth canal, we want our pelvic floor to relax. It has to relax because if it is tight, it is going to compress the vaginal walls and it's going to make it really hard for baby's head to pass through. There's essentially going to be a block there. And that can be extremely challenging for our people who are used to barbell training and they are pushing where, when they're pushing their pelvic floor is contracting. When we think about this, it means that we have to be able to unlearn a little bit of what we do during barbell movements at the barbell mamas. If you are on a pregnant program, you have what we call birth prep workouts. We put you into positions that lengthen the pelvic floor and try to give you that awareness of what it feels like to have your pelvic floor relax. We tend to be, myself admittedly, I'm part of this club. We tend to be part of the tight pelvic floor club. And it is an advantage for us to be part of the tight pelvic floor club because we put a lot of strain on our body and our pelvic floor needs to withstand that strain so that we do not pee or poop when we don't want to be peeing or pooping. What that means though, is that it's going to take us time to throttle that back and learn to relax when we're holding our breath and trying to give birth to our baby. And I do not want you to assume that you're going to just in that moment be able to unlearn that because we're going to go to our default patterns, especially when we're in pain. And so doing work, and we do this every week on our programs and we put in the disclaimer, of course, we can't 
force people, but we say, please do not skip this. Take the time and try to work through that relaxation. And some people may be thinking, well, Christina, I'm going to breathe out on my pushing. I don't need to close my, my uh, breath. Here's the thing. <laughs> we can have the best of intentions to be exhaling during every push. But just like with barbell training, when we're trying to breathe out, there are going to be moments where we end up holding our breath. And when we look at some of the research on pushing and they call it open versus closed lattice. So open being versus closed being where I'm holding my breath. We see that closed glottis tends to be a bit more productive for most people in that it does allow us to make more progress of baby descending down a bit faster. And when we even try to coach an open position of exhaling, only about 50 to 60% of the time versus hundred percent of the time with closed 50 to 60% of the time we're keeping an open airway. And that was just in, in smaller studies. And some people are going to be better at it than others. But that to me means that I am going to teach my clients both and work on the relaxation piece of the pelvic floor while we are exhaling and when we are holding our breath. And I've had plenty of people come back to me and say, that was my second labor. And the first one, I definitely was working against myself. Like the feeling of when I was actually relaxing my pelvic floor versus when I wasn't totally different, like night and day experience. And what we can see is that some barbell athletes end up with what's called failure to progress, where people are pushing and pushing and pushing, and they're not making any progress of baby coming down into the birth canal. That can be for tons of different reasons. It is not just that you have somehow failed in your labor and delivery. If this was the way that your story went, know that baby being sunny side up, which is in a different position, like flipped head is still coming down, but faces the other way. Or where if you have a shoulder dystocia, which could be an obstetrical emergency, like there's lots of different reasons why you may have that failure to progress. However, this is one modifiable way that you can try and help contribute to better progress with your pushing stage, especially with a barbell athlete who is so used to kind of tightening up their pelvic floor as they're holding their breath in order to create pressure in their belly and lift more weights. The other piece of that, oh, I was just thinking about something and then I, I lost my train of thought. I'm sure it'll come back to me. Oh yeah, here it is. All right, third part. So positioning, breast strategy. The third part is you're going to push that baby out. No problem. You're going to have quick, quick, quick labor. That doesn't always happen either, nor do we always want it to be that way. Okay. Number three. And the last thing that we're going to talk about in today's episode is around that second stage. Do we want to get that baby out as quick as possible? You're going to hear some people say it was three pushes. No problem. Out this baby came flew out, spit out my vagina and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. That is great. But that doesn't always lead to the best outcomes. Here's what I mean. I said during the second stage of labor that we have this cyclical pattern, this wave of contractions like we had when labor started. That wave of contractions continues all the way until baby is born. When we are thinking about that, we don't want to push when our body is telling us to relax. There is, and it's a little bit easier if you don't have the epidural because you can feel it a little bit more, but with the epidural, sometimes they'll use the fetal monitoring to tell you, yep, your, your body's telling you to push again. You want to try and move with your body's rhythms. And when we deliver the head and the shoulders a little bit slower, which is very hard to do in a unmedicated delivery because you're in that ring of fire, you are in it. But when we deliver the head and shoulders a little bit slower, it can sometimes circumvent some of the tearing that can happen. Example with my two labors, I was induced with my daughter. I was having some high blood pressure issues. I did all the things right. That did not mean that I failed. It's just 
there was a lot of life stress going on with me. I think that was one of the contributing factors to my hypertension. I was induced. I was unmedicated, pushing, baby came out. When her head came out, they realized that she had a umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. Seems very scary. Freaked my husband out. Happens a lot more than you think. It's when there's, especially when there's multiple, um, circ- us, us, this umbilical cord is around the neck multiple times. It can, it can be a, an emergency. So when an obstetrician sees that they will try and very quickly deliver the shoulders and pop the umbilical cord over the head as quickly as can, they can to make sure there is no occlusion or blocking off of the baby's airway. That meant that I wasn't able to deliver her through the head and shoulders slower. She kind of had to get a little bit more of a forceful exit. No p- fault of anybody's. It was just the, the circumstances of my labor. I had a grade two tear with her. She was a teeny, teeny baby, five pounds, 15 ounces, grade two tear. My son, where that wasn't the case, again, had an unmedicated delivery and he had his head was in the 95th percentile. So he was seven, three, but his head was big, but I was able to push slower during the head and shoulders. I didn't have any tearing except for some superficial stuff that, you know, was kind of like a paper cut that grade one is kind of like a paper cut. This is my anecdotal stories, but kind of what we see is if we can go with baby's natural rhythms, sometimes we can avoid the same magnitude of tearing that we would experience if we were trying to force baby out against our rhythms, just to try and get baby out as quick as possible. So much easier said than done because when you're in that moment, you're like, oh my gosh, I want to be as productive as possible. Sometimes your, your team is saying that. So having a support saying, you know, I'm going to slow this down is great, especially if baby is doing well and monitoring is going great. For Quinn, I had to move from my right side, I side, I pushed on my side so that I was safe from free. Um, and when I was on my left, they couldn't get the monitor as well. So when they flip, they just flipped me to my right, but he was doing great. I was with my own rhythms. Hubby was there and I had a, a very smooth um, labor and delivery experience, despite some of the craziness that is the time for another podcast about birth stories and how important they can be. But um was able to have a lot less tearing with the positioning that I wanted um, for, for my deliveries, which were um, unmedicated. I didn't have an epidural. So for the barbell athlete, it is important for us to think about our preferences for labor and delivery. Take some time, think about the positions you want to be in, learn about some of the different positions. If you can see a provider that can do some birth prep, or you know a person who's providing birth prep classes, I really encourage you to do some of the online or in-person sessions that are run by our midwives. They can have great for what to do with baby once baby comes home. But then our pelvic floor PTs talk about it from mom's body um, in terms of trying to create a situation where you feel really empowered with the decisions you're making with your body during that moment and hopefully give you ideas about what to expect. While I talked about um, physiological progression of pregnancy without any augmentation or surgery, induction and cesarean are options. And if I am doing a session with somebody, even if they want an unmedicated vaginal delivery, they want it at home, I am still going to talk to them about what induction is like. I'm still going to talk to them about what a C-section is. I'm still going to talk to them about what a hospital birth would look like because If it goes that way, not to say that it will, but if it does, I want you to know what to expect rather than having a very clear picture of your birth that you wanted this way and not being aware of any other circumstances. And then you're thrust into those circumstances you had not prepared for. And that's, that can be a scarier place to be. So things that we want to consider when it comes to your labor and delivery, as a barbell athlete, trying to work on that tight pelvic floor tendency is kind of something specific to this group of individuals. But no, there is no right or wrong answer. There is just the right and wrong answer for you. 
And that is a conversation with your support system. That's a, a conversation with your provider. If you're having a doula, which is the support person for a laboring individual, that is something to whatever my client wants, everybody's going to have their own story. You know, I have some people who are like very adamant about doing an unmedicated and I have other people who are like giving the epidural as fast as possible. That is what I want. I do not want to feel any contraction. Give me. And both of those are fine. Both of those are great. So you can just kind of figure out what works for you and then get your providers on board with that. And my final piece of advice is know those positions, know those breathing strategies, know your options, know what you want, but know that a birth plan is something that can be written, but not laminated. You want to know what those options are. Know maybe if there is going to be interventions, what you feel comfortable with, what you don't. Make sure your partner knows that as well. And then ride the wave <laughs> that is labor and delivery. Parenting, I always feel like, is so much about not having control over your schedule nearly as much anymore. And birth can be your first kind of thrust into that where, you know, there's many times where baby doesn't come when we wanted to. It takes a lot longer or shorter than we expected. And we just have to relinquish some of that control to our body's natural rhythms and let baby come with the plan that they had and go from there. All right. I hope you found this episode helpful. If you have any other questions, please let me know. We'll do some posts on social media about preparing for labor and delivery. Otherwise have a wonderful week. I hope I wasn't too jittery with excitement from some of these meetings and we will see you all on the next episode.